Hello everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am Jessica Henry Gray and I'm really excited to have you with me today. Today I want to show you how to paint a sunflower field. So I have a story that goes with this one. I was out and about driving around here in Avon, Ohio and I've driven past this sunflower field for years and never really knew what it was about so I stopped and um, got out and looked at it and took some pictures. So I'm going to be painting this one in the studio and during the course of this video I will do a voiceover and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story. It's very heartwarming and I have some ideas that I also want to share with you. So stay tuned to the end and follow the links down below. I think you're going to enjoy this one and be sure to check out um, all those other links. I have um, room in my Ohio workshop still as well as uh, space in the Zoom workshops coming up. I've got a landscape plein air zoom workshop we're going to be talking about beginning plein air from landscapes just like this in the studio and how to sort of get your mind in the game for plein air painting while you're in the studio working from a photo so that's the zoom workshop for the landscape and then i have one also on portrait painting four sessions coming up um, in november so check out those links i think you're going to enjoy those we've got some spots in both of those left and i'm excited to share with you some information that i have on that and so let's jump in and get going on this. Hey everybody, welcome back to my studio. I'm really excited to get going on this painting with you. Um, I have a 14 by 17 canvas here and I'm just beginning by toning it with a little bit of cadmium yellow and today I have squeezed out a little bit of Indian yellow. Um, that's that more golden color. It's a little bit different than yellow ochre. Yellow ochre has a little bit more of an earthy tone to it. Um, Indian yellow has this transparent glow that I just kind of liked and I was looking for in this painting. Um, I don't always tone the canvas, but in this case I thought if some of this glow comes through, especially on this day that was particularly foggy, um, then that's great and I want some of that effect. I didn't know 100% when I began this painting whether or not it would be completely covering the surface. So in the event that any of this canvas showed through, I really wanted that glowing effect. Now um, this field is called Maria's Field of Hope and this is planted here in Avon, Ohio. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about it while I'm kind of doing this part of the painting where it's not a whole lot going on. Uh, anyway, so this is a field planted in honor of Maria who in 2006 was diagnosed with um, brain tumors. Brain, she had brain cancer. Um, I, she prayed for other children who were going through the similar situations that she met while she was in the hospital. Um, a year later, she passed away, and in honor of her memory, they, um, they planted this field. Every year they add more flowers. Um, people can go and uh, people who donate money, they can put a little tag on the flowers. Each of those flowers you can see here in the foreground have a little paper on them, a little tag. And on that tag is a message um, that other people have written to children that they've lost through cancer. And I, I wasn't aware of all that. I've driven past this field for years and 
didn't know that that's what all those flowers represented. I got out of my car and I stood there and I read the little tags and on the back of one is a, uh, on each tag is a poem, it's a prayer, a sunflower prayer. Um, but it's just incredibly touching and, and what they've done with this foundation. They've raised $7.85 million for pediatric cancer research and um, as a result over the years they have come up with two drugs that are working for children and um, so that's very encouraging. Anyway, um, I, I do want to go in and out of talking about that foundation throughout this painting but I do want to tell you what I'm doing here right now. Okay, so uh, as you saw I wiped off that brilliant color and allowed um, some of the yellow to show through. I always tone the canvas a little bit darker than I'm going to need because I know I'm always going to wipe some of it off because if I didn't, there's a very slick surface and that would be hard to paint over. All right, so then I just made a darker brownish color and I started blocking in the composition as I saw it. The trees, I try to stick with angular lines in my paintings. The trees, I'm looking for all those big blocky angles and at this point now you can see my brush I am laying down a compositional design of the flowers what I loved about this photograph that I had is that they pretty much are in place it compositionally in a really attractive sort of arrangement I chose this particular photograph because I liked the dirt ground there it sort of um, pointed us into the picture and then back so I, I maximize on that and now I'm blocking in the darkest values in the trees um, kind of pushing those a little bit further because I need to have that being an anchor. If I made everything sort of the middle tone value that you kind of see in the photo reference, it would just be sort of washed out. So I'm making sure that my darks are prominent and that you can see them. <clears throat> that, that that backdrop to the flowers has sort of an inviting, almost like arms embracing these flower fields and then the distant trees were important as well. All right, so now I am isolating that darker value created by the dirt in the soil right there. That also provides that nice shadow for underneath the flowers, giving them a sense of dimension. And then mixing up, as you can see in this uh, painting, I'm using just a basic palette. I guess I didn't introduce my colors. Titanium white. I have cadmium yellow medium as well as cadmium lemon. And then I also have the Indian yellow on there. And I do use bits and mixes of these throughout the painting. I have cadmium red light, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue. Um, I also have phthalo green and alizarin crimson, which I don't use any of the alizarin crimson in this painting, so it's not essential. Um, but the cadmium red I do use later um, in doing the glow on the inside of the flowers. So. But if you wanted to follow along with this picture, you really don't need much um, for, of that. Anyway, blocking in the soil, um, trying to find where and anywhere I can see it in the photo. And I liked how it came off to the right of the painting and then sort of tucked back up in. It allowed the viewer that sense of composition, that, that weight of stay in the painting. Okay, so when the composition is all in place, my values and um, I just isolated a few flowers where I need them. I can then begin on the background. So this background it was a very overcast sky. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons I went out that day was because I loved the heavy fog that was in the air. And I thought, um, I gotta go to the sunflower field and see if there's this beautiful fog. But when I got there, the fog had lifted a little, but I did, um, I liked the backdrop of an overcast sky. Um, I typically don't try to paint flower scenes with a brilliant blue sky because it competes with the color of the flowers so much. So to me, having an overcast sky with this backdrop of sunflowers really allowed the, um, the vibrancy and the chrome of this painting to focus on the flowers and not the sky. Okay, so I did add a little bit of burnt sienna into that sky mixture. As it got closer to the horizon, I added a little bit more blue. It almost made it feel like wet, rainy sky back there. Um, and then of course the trees, they were had a little bit of mist and fog shrouding them. So their color and value is really close to um, that shade back there for the sky. Just a slight bit different greenish gray. A um, little bit of darker values to pop in for some of those darker trees. And then I mix up a little bit um, more of a springier green 
just to give a little bit more variety and mixture to that passage back there. And then I take some of the sky and carve it into that grove of trees just to give it a little bit more interest. I don't want it to become distracting though, so um, I keep my brush strokes really soft and muted back there. And the longer you focus on something, the more you see all its detail. And so you have to be careful when looking at a scene like this Try not to focus on the detail so much. As I look at the painting and I look at the sunflowers, and if I stay looking at the sunflowers, how much detail do I really see peripherally in those background trees? And that's how you have to paint them. So you don't stare at them and paint all the little twigs and branches because it defeats that feeling of distance and atmosphere and so forth. So keep them soft, keep them muted, let them be in the background. Their function is to provide an embracing um, compositional support to the scene in front. As I'm painting the um, ground now, instead of having my paintbrush do vertical brush strokes, I'm turning it now to do and reflect a horizontal land, which gives you that illusion of being having a flat um, meadow. Uh, the photograph was pretty flat um, as far as the meadow goes, but I wanted a slight rise to the land. So I allow, allow my brush strokes to sort of do this slight rise to the um, scene there. And I think it helps with some of the topographical interest in the um, the whole foreground. Now I'm mixing up my brush strokes between a chalky sage green, which gives it um, that distant color of um, that allowing atmosphere in between you and the distance. I love that sage green, which is essentially yellow ochre, ultramarine blue, and then some white. Um, you could even add a, the smallest touch of phthalo green, but it's, I, and it's not an essential. The point is to keep that back, that back there very cool and misty. I added little um, marks of cadmium yellow mixed in with the green, but that sort of gives you the illusion that this sunflower field goes back for acres, way back. Um, now, before I got too far on the foreground, I wanted to start building up the trees in the foreground, this cluster of trees. So I begin by blocking in the information. When I squint down at those trees, uh, instead of drawing all the little tiny leaves and twigs and branches as I saw them, I just squinted and painted the mass that I saw, the color that that mass was. I come back through here later and I carve out sky and soften edges and work those trees a little bit more, but in the beginning I just block in the passages where I see them, concentrating my efforts on what color do I see in these trees. Don't worry about the details yet. Um, so that is just, they're, they're varying degrees, mixtures of yellow ochre, ultramarine blue, little bit of yellow, um, but that's it. Just keep it um, very quiet and muted. Now, in this cluster of trees, I noticed some of the trees were darker green, some were cooler blue, some were more brilliant yellow green. And so I allow for that variance, which gives it a little bit of interest without being too distracting. And then, um, really take the time to observe the shapes of your clusters of trees. What you'll find is trees aren't shaped like we think, like we have this formulaic idea of how trees are supposed to be shaped. Most often when you have a little forest scene like this, you have this low-lying brush in the foreground at the base, which are a different color <laughs> than the trees as they move upwards. Um, so just, just be aware of the variety that we see in nature and take the time to observe those. Um, I, I have found that just taking the time to observe nature to be one of the most relaxing and therapeutic things we can do with our lives, with our mind, our actions, just, yeah, just calm right down. <laughs> uh, so where those two trees were separate, I um, just blocked in that, you can see it on the photo, the darker shadows just separating those two tree clusters. 
I sort of capitalized on the foreground tree as having a little bit more cooler blue um, in the leaves. Might have been a different kind of tree, but I wanted to push that a little bit more as those branches came at us and the shadows slipped back under the tree in a cool blue tone like that. So that's what I'm working on there. I know I say a lot about cool and warms. Um, I really want to encourage you to get that in your painting vocabulary. Don't worry if it takes you a while. It took me years to really be fluent in understanding. It's like a new language, um, but it's vital. It is critical to your painting. Understand cool and warm. Cool being in the, um, if you imagine it being like icy, cold. It's in the blue family. It means distance, further back. Things that are cool are farther away. Why? Because there's more atmosphere in between you and that further background. Warm being um, warmth. We think of fire, we think of heat. Um, up close to you, our bodies are warm. Anything closer to you is going to be warm. So in the context of this tree and even in the foreground, um, things that are up close have a warmth to them. So even when I'm painting the greens in the foreground, and I'll get to this when I get to that passage, I use a lot more warmer tones in the overall green and foliage in the foreground. And then I push the cooler for the background. And that, that's how you paint atmosphere. Soften your edges in the background, and a lot more sky is in between you and it. So it's gonna diffuse edges. It's going to give you more of a lighter blue haze. And that's atmosphere. All right, now um, I'm beginning to put in the darker greens in the foliage where I see them in the foreground. To be honest, it, when you look at a field of sunflowers, it's kind of overwhelming, like, where do I even begin? <laughs> um, so that's why I began with the ground up, um, the soil first, the dark shadows, and then I'm building up uh, the dark greens. To this, I will mass in the greens in the background. Um, but you gotta start somewhere. At this point, shortly after here, I will start to put in the flowers. They're not in any sort of detail, but you've gotta block in your composition and those flower heads are paramount to the composition. So I'm gonna have to decide exactly where they're gonna live and how big they're gonna be. What, what level of importance is this flower as opposed to that flower? And I'll get to all that. So again, just um, mapping out my greens, dark greens and shadows. Now to do the flowers, I first started out with the browns. Where am I gonna put all the middles? And I thought that that was an easier way to sort of isolate, here's this flower, here's this flower. Instead of beginning with the yellow blob, I, I did just the brown middle. And some of them were just um, almost like footballs or flat frisbees. And then once I had those in place, then I could kind of play with the shape of the circle surrounding. Not all of them had a perfect donut around each one. Um, as in this case uh, that I'm working on back there, that was a flatter, it was had its head down. So um, you just have to, it almost looked like a little face, looked down with the hair coming down around. And so I just played with some of those. As you can see here, they're not exactly the right color that they're gonna be right now. I'm just grabbing a yellow, just to help me define where they're gonna live so that I can start to figure out my greens around there. And so I block them in at this point, I'm pretty soon here and then I work on the rest of the background.
Now, even though it just looks like I'm randomly putting paint down, I'm not. I'm consciously being aware of each brush stroke and the way that it reflects a flower leaf on the stem. So I'm just, I'm kind of putting them down in sort of a horizontal, jagged sort of way. And then you can see the progression of um, cool in the background as it comes around to the foreground. It's warmer down below, brighter, richer green. And um, so that that's something I want you to notice too. You don't really see it as much in the photograph, but from experience in plein air painting, experience tells me it was cooler back there. And so that's one of the hazards and pitfalls you gotta watch out for in working from photos is that it doesn't really pick up atmosphere, the values get too extreme, whites wash out to white, shadows are too black, um, and the cool and warm you don't see as much in photos. So, I mean, one of the reasons we say, you know, don't work from photos is because of that. And students get too um, committed to um, being literal to photos when the reality of life is so much more beautiful and there's so much more variety and cool and warmth and, you know, um, the shadows aren't too extreme and the whites aren't too white. So really, as much as you can get out and plein air paint, you learn to become a student of truth in nature. And that is what I, I'm, I'm drawing on here as I'm painting this sunflower field, what it looked like when I was really there. Um, so what I'm doing here now is I, I've blocked in all the green and I'm coming back through with a darker green to define around some of those lighter passages. So I'm putting the darker around what it, are lighter leaves. They're shadows. I'm creating the shadows under the flower heads and under some larger leaves and um, just using that as I work my way towards the background. And of course, as you go towards the background, all of those shadows lessen. You don't see all the detail and information back there, but it is more pronounced up front. So I do try to keep um, my shadows and lines crisper and cleaner and sharper up front and then let them just sort of dissolve into the background. As my values and shadows recede into the background, I just add, a, it's a little bit lighter of that darker value, um, softer little chunks basically of horizontal interest in the landscape. And you can see back here, as I work further back, it's a little lighter and you can see I just start doing some horizontal 
texture basically to that far distant metal. I'll add a lot more flowers over the top of all this, but I need to have that foundation of um, what is happening with the landscape and the various shadows. It gives it a sense of distance and reality. Now I've taken some cadmium yellow with some of that cadmium yellow lemon and just putting in some small far away and there's a little green in there too just to keep it further in the background. I didn't want the yellow from back there competing with the yellow that's up front. You can't have that flat sameness all across the spectrum otherwise it doesn't read again as distance. So just taking small little horizontal strokes that suggest flowers and I'm putting them scattering them where I see them and again here you have to be very cognizant of your composition um, so I'm, I'm watching as I'm putting in these clumps of yellow to make sure that I didn't just cover it all in dots of yellow but you can see that they're sort of artistically placed um, again not being hundred percent committed to the photo but using that artistic license to develop the painting the way I think compositionally and artistically it should um, you can take your inspiration from um, nature, but you, in, in contexts like this, you've got to make those decisions. Um, so now I am just blending in the, or like merging those background dots to the foreground flowers. There's sort of that medium in there where the flowers get a little bit bigger from the background and then they meet up with the large ones in front. Okay, so when I'm content that those flowers are all in place, I'm coming back through here now with a lighter, almost a sky blue green um, for the surfaces of the leaves on the flowers that are facing the sky. So they are picking up the sky blue reflection or the atmospheric, <laughs> it wasn't really sky blue, on the tops of the leaves. And in the photo reference, when I show it again, you can see that some of those leaves really do pick up that chalky blue, which gives it that um, element of reality. Sunflower feels, uh, leaves feel kind of itchy and, um, I don't know, like cat's tongues, sort of. And so they, because of those little fibers, they're not glossy, they pick up atmosphere. All right, now I'm putting it, a little bit of it back in the background, just to, again, to push that cooler blue further back. I noticed um, even just as I sat in my chair and looked at the picture, I needed more atmosphere, even more so than what was showing on the photo, just had to put a little bit back there. I also like that impressionistic flavor that doing those small dabs allowed, um, just had a really nice texture to the field back there. Now I'm picking out some leaves um, for a little more detail and information you could see back there or in the foreground I was doing. Now these trees um, I went through and carved out some sky holes and added a little bit more texture to the actual foliage. Um, just working on this middle tree here had that brighter yellow green color adding a little bit more information to the tree as well. And I took some dark lines and drew those in for the trunks and some gray lines for the trunks where there was shadow. I made those trees stand out a little more by that lighter gray color. Taking some of that um, springy green back there, adding it to the field, some yellow spots as well. Giving it a little bit more information and detail back there. Okay, so now I'm going through and starting to clean up the flowers a little bit more. The centers, I want to start with those, um, just making the brown 
um, feel more like the center of a sunflower. They have a really interesting design and so in, just in a few of the flowers up front that are very noticeable, I wanted to work on creating that shape of the center. Not all of them get this treatment, but the ones that are right in front, sort of as the star of the show, they get that treatment. Now where the center of the flower touched the petals, I didn't want a sharp, crisp edge there, so I took a little bit of that cadmium red into the, I, I let my brush touch the brown and touch the yellow, and it sort of softened that transition from the middle of the flower to the petals. And I really like that, and I took some of the brown from the center and drug it into the petals to give it that illusion of, um, that I saw in the flowers. Okay, so this bamboo cane, this is my newest um, studio piece of furniture. I'm really excited to have it. I found it in an antique store. It's an actual walking cane, so it has a curve at the top. Um, I literally found it for $2. I was so excited. <laughs> I thought it was cool. Um, but I needed a mall stick for situations like this too, where the whole painting is wet, and I don't want to obviously rest my hand on the painting. So I hook the cane on the top of my easel and it just hangs there perfectly away from the painting and I can rest my hand on it and I can slide the cane across the top of my easel to be wherever I need it to be to rest my hand on it. So good investment if you guys find a walking stick or a cane, it makes a great mall stick. I've had regular mall sticks and dowels that I've used, but in none of the situations can you just hook it like that. So I was really happy to have that. All right, now I'm going through again and just adding more detail to the flowers. Um, isolating some of the petals and cleaning up the centers and um, that yellow, that, I'm sorry, that red added just this beautiful glow to each one of these flowers. I didn't put it on all of them, um, but some of them that where you could see a little bit more of the center, as you can see, <laughs> needed a little more. Some of the uh, sunflowers that were facing downwards, um, their petals were in shadow, so I painted those darker. And you can see here this really great tip technique. Um, put your paint on a palette knife so you don't have to keep going way back down to your easel every time if you're gonna work on a passage like this. Um, and that's another reason why I like a cane mall stick because I don't have to hold it with my other hand. I can hang it on my easel and then my other hand is free to bring a palette knife up um, so I can work on small detailed information. So those little tiny paint brushes do not hold very much paint, so you're back and forth to your palette all the time. So kind of bringing it up closer to you shortens that distance and is handy. All right, now I just took some bright yellow. This is cadmium yellow with some lemon yellow. These flowers that are up close are the most brilliant and bright, and so I really needed that to be clean. And so I found in some of these passages I was really fighting with some of the background um, green. But if you put the paint on clear and thick enough and don't mussy your brush strokes back and forth back and forth you don't you're not likely to pick up much of that background color so lay the paint down and try not to mess with it too much um, and that's how you can lay color over color and not get it to uh, mix so just cleaning up around these working on some of the petals um, and then I also take green and carve it into the flower petals just to refine their shapes a little bit more.
Okay, so this downward turned sunflower, um, the flower petals that are underneath are a darker yellow green, but the ones on top are getting a lot more of the light. So that gives that flower there that wonderful sense of um, dimension. Like if you can think of a dinner plate turned downwards, that's what we have going on here and try to imagine that elliptical um, shape like that. And then the petals just sort of dangling like fringe. Um, love that effect. And I don't show it in this video, but I did go back through afterwards and put the backs of those sunflowers on the ones that are turned downwards. Um, they have this wonderful sense of sculptural, the green petals as they hold those big heads downwards. So I, I got that on there. Um, but they're, that's important to observe just on the ones that are up close. You don't need it all over the place. Now I don't show on camera, but towards the end, I do paint little tags on some of the sunflowers. Those tags are written by families who have lost children to cancer and they're little memorials to each of the children. And I thought that just having a few of those on some of the foreground flowers were very important. Um, and so I add those later. Okay, so now I'm at the point of the painting where it's just a matter of detail. And that's all I'm doing is I'm cleaning up some of the flowers and pulling in a little bit more of that information. Now I'm asked often, how do you know when you're done with the painting? You are done with the painting when you have reached the thing it is that you wanted to say. And you would only know what it is you wanted to say if you had that vision from the beginning. So you've got to have your statement clear before you start painting. And when you've arrived there, you're done. So this is the finished painting, and I wanted to thank you guys so much for joining me. And be sure to check out the links below, and I will be offering this print as a fundraiser for Maria's Field of Hope. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. All right, everybody, well, that wraps us up. I hope that you enjoyed painting along with me in Maria's Field of Hope. 
and um, this painting is a very special one and be sure to check out the links if you would like a print on this one to support their foundation the links are all going to be below so i thank you so much already in advance for your support to this cause and um, i just hope that you all have a wonderful week and go ahead and try this one i hope you enjoy it you don't have to do something as big you can even just select a smaller portion some sunflowers all right so that wraps up this week and i will see you next time bye bye guys